is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. And welcome visitors and church family. We are just so happy to have you here. You know, a small grain of faith can start a miracle in your life today. Seek God with all your heart. You are loved. We're so glad you're joining us today. And we're also so honored to have Daniel Fusco in the house giving the message. Our family's been able to have a little time this summer together. And so it's been nice having a couple of weeks to not put a message together. And so grateful my friend Daniel is here with us. So welcome, Daniel. We're so glad you're in the house. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done in our lives. And we pray in Jesus' name that we would end this service encouraged, uplifted. We thank you that you've sent Daniel to us today to give us a good word. And we pray in Jesus' name we'll receive it. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, God loves you and so do I. In preparation for the message, Psalm 144, 13. Our barns will be filled with every kind of provision. Our sheep will increase by thousands, by tens of thousands in our fields. Our oxen will draw heavy loads. There will be no breaching of walls, no going into captivity, no cry of distress in our streets. 
Blessed is the people of whom this is true. Blessed is the people whose God is the Lord. Amen. Good morning, family. Today I dedicate this song to anyone who may not know or may have forgotten that God loves you. I've been trying to figure out what it means to be human, flesh and bone, the spirit and the soul. If I cannot earn your love by trying to measure up, why do I think I lose it in the lows? Then somehow you see through my heart and welcome me with open arms just as I am. In the good and the bad, God, you still understand. And you never stop loving me just as I am. With the heart of the Father and grace like no other. No, you never stop loving me just as I am. You've been patient with my wandering, always knowing what I need. With a gentle hand, you show me where to go. Now there hasn't been a moment you weren't calling out to me. and I are so happy that you've joined us in worship today, and we hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Several years ago, I began practicing the Creed of the Beloved by saying it aloud each day, and now it's become a vital part of the walk that I have with the Lord. Though simple, these words have changed me from the inside out and given me renewed vision, joy, and energy. Every week on Our Power, we recite the Creed, which says, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me, I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it away from me. I don't have to worry, I don't have to hurry, I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. And that's the truth, dear friend. By resting in the Lord's boundless and unconditional love, you will experience the fullness of his blessings. When you embrace your position as his beloved child, you will be empowered to step into your true identity, to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow his call on your life. 
Though it's not magic, practicing this creed changed the dial on my life one degree at a time. Well, I didn't notice like a huge difference at first, as I regularly trained and aligned my mind with the Word of God, I developed a deep sense of rootedness and contentment. And I believe this can happen to you too. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, we want to send you this Creed of the Beloved bookmark. As you meditate on the truths it contains, we believe it has the potential to transform your life from the inside out. Write to Hour of Power, New Zealand, P.O. Box 26209, Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. You can tap into the energy, power, and joy that comes from living in the kingdom of God when you walk every day in your identity as His beloved. As always, we're extremely grateful for your friendship and we're continually praying for you. God loves you and so do we.
I are so happy that you've joined us in worship today, and we hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Several years ago, I began practicing the Creed of the Beloved by saying it aloud each day, and now it's become a vital part of the walk that I have with the Lord. Though simple, these words have changed me from the inside out and given me renewed vision, joy, and energy. Every week on Our Power, we recite the Creed, which says, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me, I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it away from me. I don't have to worry, I don't have to hurry, I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. And that's the truth, dear friend. By resting in the Lord's boundless and unconditional love, you will experience the fullness of his blessings. When you embrace your position as his beloved child, you will be empowered to step into your true identity, to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow his call on your life. Though it's not magic, practicing this creed changed the dial on my life one degree at a time. Well, I didn't notice like a huge difference at first as I regularly trained and aligned my mind with the Word of God, I developed a deep sense of rootedness and contentment. And I believe this can happen to you too. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, 
we want to send you this Creed of the Beloved bookmark. As you meditate on the truths it contains, we believe it has the potential to transform your life from the inside out. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, PO Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. You can tap into the energy, power, and joy that comes from living in the kingdom of God when you walk every day in your identity as His beloved. As always, we're extremely grateful for your friendship and we're continually praying for you. God loves you and so do we. Well, we're so glad you're joining us this morning or this evening, wherever you are and whoever you are. Would you stand with us? Hold your hands out like this as a way of receiving from the Holy Spirit. We're going to say this creed together. I'm not what I do. I'm not what I have. I'm not what people say about me. I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it from me. I don't have to worry. I don't have to hurry. I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. Thanks, you could be seated. Well, I'm so overjoyed to have Daniel Fusco in the house sharing with us. You probably have seen him before. Daniel Fusco is a talented speaker and author who currently serves as the lead pastor of Crossroads Community Church in Vancouver, Washington. Though he was raised as a Catholic in New Jersey, he gave his life to Jesus and in his last year at Rutgers University felt called to pastoral ministry. After being ordained, he went on to plant multiple ch churches in New Jersey and California before rooting himself in Crossroads Community Church. We've also interviewed him here a couple of times. I've been on his podcast. He's a great friend and a great pastor. Would you please welcome with me Daniel Fusco. Well, good morning, everybody. How's everyone doing this morning? Great. Pretty great. So my name is Daniel Fusco. I get the pleasure of being a lead pastor at an amazing church called Crossroads Community Church, which is in Vancouver, Washington. Vancouver, Washington. People all the time say to me, oh, I love Vancouver, B.C. And I say, yeah, I don't live there. I actually live in Vancouver, Washington, which is just over the Columbia River from Portland, Oregon. So I like to joke that I live in the lesser Vancouver. So when you woke up this morning and it was a little overcast, you can thank me for that because we brought that cloudy weather down from the Pacific Northwest just to give you a quick reprieve from the, just from the, the sunshine that you're so used to here. Uh, it's, it's so funny, as a pastor, I'm going to take you behind the veil a little bit for pastors when you have guest speakers that um, you always invite your friends in to, to, to teach when you're away. And so, but it's always a win-win for the pastor because if you really like the guest preacher, you're like, oh man, my pastor's got some great friends. And so it's a win. And if you really don't like the guest preacher, you just think to yourself, I am so grateful that person is not my pastor. <laughs> and so either way, Pastor Bobby gets a win. And, and listen, if you're visiting today, please do not judge this amazing church based on me. But I'm excited to get to share with you today. And before I get going, uh, my I, I, want, I want to say hello from my beloved bride, Lynn. And we have three amazing kids. Uh, our oldest, his name is Obadiah. He's 16 years old. And then our middle child, his name is Maranatha. She's 13 year old. So you realize that with having kids named Obadiah and Maranatha, you know, we have a pretty high standard of biblical names. So eight years ago when my wife said, but she's like, hey, we're pregnant. I'm like, great. What are we going to name the child? I'm like, man, with an Obadiah and a Maranatha, we have a, you know, a really high level. I'm like, maybe we can get a Nebuchadnezzar or a, a, a Zerubbabel. I, I lobbied pretty hard for Jehoshaphat, and my wife was like, yeah, no. And so we ended up with a little Annabelle. Oh, everyone says that. They say, oh, Annabelle. Annabelle's crazy, though. She's seven. She's, she sucks her thumb. She's like me, but she's cute, and she doesn't have a beard. And, but she's got, like, just... <laughs> Big personality, so you can pray for us, you know. We always like to joke that we shot all of our good parenting bullets on the first two. And then we were so used to being parents, and on the third, we're like, oh, she's going to be fine. She's not fine. Pray for us. <laughs> I love her so much, though. But I want to say hello. My kids always feel really excited when they make it into the sermon. So, so thank you for that on behalf of my kids. So I want to share with you something today that is so important to all of us because it's something that we all are seeking after. 
It doesn't matter where somebody is on their faith journey, whether somebody has been walking with Jesus for a long time or whether someone is just exploring life, faith. At some point, everybody wants to be happy. It's, it's a normal part of human existence. I want to be happy. And, and given how complicated life can be, how challenging things go, at some point somebody always asks a simple question like, well, doesn't God want me to be happy? And what's interesting is if you've ever, you, we've all asked that question, and oftentimes that question comes up in a number of different places. Sometimes it comes up when everything is just going wrong, right? Like you go to the doctor and all of a sudden you get that lousy diagnosis or, you know, there's troubles at home, there's troubles in the world. Where you think about all the things that we have been going through and are going through kind of as a culture right now. And there's a part of us like, like, where is God in all this? What is God trying to do in all of this? There's financial pressures. And so we ask that question sometimes because we, we find ourselves being unhappy, Right? Another time we ask that question is when we start searching after things to kind of pacify our need for happiness, right? Where you're like, man, God must want me to be happy, so I definitely deserve that new car, right? Or, man, I definitely need to change careers. Or, you know, God, you know I should definitely, definitely take those extra four days on that vacation because God wants me to be happy. And, and, and this is normal parts of human life. Some of you are saying, well, the extra four days on the vacation is not the normal part of my human life, but I'm going to start doing that. Thanks very much, Musco. But we start asking this question, doesn't God want me to be happy? And, and, and the question is, a, it's a longing that comes out of the depths of all of our souls because we're looking for a life that is fulfilling. We're looking for a life that is satisfying. Now, as a pastor and as an author, all the time people say to me, well, well, Fusco, doesn't God want me to be happy? And I want to answer that question because I don't want to leave you hanging. The answer to that question is, is, yes, God wants you to be happy. I, I, one time I, I was at a, a church and I heard a pastor and someone says, God doesn't want you to be happy. And I thought to myself, I would leave if I heard that. Like, if you only get one shot at life on this side of eternity, like, doesn't God want you to be happy in it? And the pastor was going, God doesn't care about your happiness. I'm like, well, actually, our Bible says something different. Psalm 144, verse 15. It's the very last verses of this beautiful psalm where it says, happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Now, isn't that powerful? Because the, the state that they're in, they're, they're in this state of where God is doing the work that he wants to do, and they're experiencing what God is doing. These people, they're happy, and then it says, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Now, what that means is that for the follower of Jesus, it doesn't say, happy are the people whose five-year plan worked out. Happy are the people who got that promotion. Happy are the people who hit that growth spurt. They didn't want to be as short as they were. And so they, you know, they grew four inches at their senior year of high school. Now all of a sudden they're, they're happy. No, it says, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. And the Bible is full of statements like this. That there's all these different realities that the person in this place is a happy person. And if you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus, the fact that Jesus is in your life is enough to make you truly happy in a way that all of the searches that we go on can never make us. I like to call it that we have a tendency to get on the hamster wheel of happiness seeking because our culture teaches us that happiness is something that comes in a change of circumstance, in a happening. And so we find ourselves constantly seeking after what is the next thing? Am I the only one who's got a PhD in happiness seeking? Right? Like you just you can try the next thing. And what you, kind of, what you find is that you, if, you, if you attain to that or if you achieve that, it makes you joyful or happy for a moment, right? And then, okay, well, that's it. Then the next one, it's like the, it's like the guy who won the Super Bowl. And he said, well, you won the Super Bowl. Well, there's always next year. Right? Or, or, or how many times somebody, something amazing happens and in the questions they're already moving them on to the next thing. Because that's the way our culture works. And 
Because we live in this, we're so used to this. And so what happens is we end up on this hamster wheel of happiness seeking. Careers, relationships, status, achievement. Now, none of those things are necessarily bad, but what we find is that none of those things actually truly fulfill us in the long term. They're momentary pacifiers for something that we're deeply longing for. So remember I said people ask me all the time, they say, they say, so Fusco, does God want me to be happy? I always answer, yes, God wants you to be happy. But then I always remind them, but happiness is not found where we're normally apt to look for it. Like, it's where we want to go to look for happiness, it's actually really not found there. And what's amazing is, is this is as old as humanity. If you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when you look at the mistake that Adam and Eve made, ultimately it was that what God has already done is not enough. There's more. You're missing something. That's the way the serpent tempted Eve, right? It's like, oh, no, listen. The reason God doesn't want you to treat the knowledge of good and evil is he's holding out on you. He's got something better. That will make you truly happy. And what's amazing is, is there's a verse that I spend a lot of time in my own life as I walk through life with people just like you. What does it mean to be alive and in Christ? What does it mean to live the abundant life? There's a verse that really speaks to this idea that the places we want to look for happiness, you actually won't find it there. And it's Jeremiah chapter 2, 13. Let me put this in context for you because if you think about the story of the children of Israel, they, they were in the promised land and God had promised them that he was going to bring them into the promised land. We, we hear these stories of the promised land being a place flowing with milk and honey. Now I'm here to tell you that the promised land wasn't because they had great milk and sweets, even though that is kind of fun, isn't it? Milk and honey means you can get ice cream. Can I get an amen? Amen. So everyone's a little bit happier at the bottom of a pint of good ice cream or gelato or whatever. But here's the deal. What made the promised land, the promised land was not the milk and honey. It was the fact that God said, my presence will be with you. So they ended up in the promised land and things went well for a little while. But then the children of Israel made the mistake that we all make, which was they started to try and find their fulfillment in other places other than God. And then you fast forward and then God starts to speak to a prophet that we know of as the prophet Jeremiah. And Jeremiah was the prophet who was declaring that, hey, things are going to go bad because you've, because you've left your first love. And so this verse, Jeremiah chapter 213, really keys us into the mistake that we could make when we're seeking happiness in the wrong places. It says this. This is the Lord speaking to the prophet Jeremiah. My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and they've hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that hold no water. Now, what's really amazing is this is so serious to God that he calls them, they're two evils. It's not like they just met, made a mistake. It's like, these are two evils. The first evil is that they've forsaken me, the fountain of living water. So, the first mistake is to turn away from God and to turn to something else. Now, I think what's fascinating is God's like, they've forsaken me, and then he calls himself the fountain of living water. Now, you could say that in another way, that he's the source of all that is life-giving. You got to remember, for the children of Israel, it wasn't like the day and age in which we live in today. Even in drought conditions, we live in an abundance of water. Like you can go to your big box store, you can buy cases of water, you can buy natural spring water, electrolyte-induced water, reverse osmosis water. I don't even know if that's really a thing. I think I heard that somewhere. So we live in a day, and if you go into your house and you turn on your faucet, water comes out. When Jeremiah was writing this, the children of Israel lived in an arid climate where there wasn't even running water. It's why there's so much wine in the Bible, not because they were all Italian. Just kidding, I'm all Italian, so I can say those type of things. But, but literally, fermented water was the only thing that was sanitary enough to drink. They didn't have running water. There, was, there wasn't a way to purify all these, the water. So when God calls himself the fountain of living water, he's saying, I have in myself all that you need for life. So the first evil is that you turn away from me who is the source of all life. 
And then notice what it says. The second evil is that, and they've hewn for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Now, what that, a cistern is a water container. So instead of embracing me, they've chosen to make ourselves these water pots. But the problem is these water pots are broken and they really won't hold any water. And right there, God diagnoses what all of us do as we're seeking after happiness. We have a tendency to say, I'm going to leave God, who is the source of all that's life-giving, and I'm going to make myself a little water pot. But the problem is, is the water pot, it'll hold a little bit of water, but it's got cracks in it. So you'll get a little bit of nourishment, but not true fulfillment. And I think if we look at our lives, all of us have done this. I see it in my own life. I didn't grow up in the church, and I, and I remember growing up, I would have all of these crazy experiences. Now that I know that we're, they were, it was rebellion against God, but I didn't know any better, and these things would be pleasurable for a moment until it left me empty. Right? I was, a, I was an aspiring musician, and I would go and I'd play an amazing gig, and it was, oh, but then was I truly fulfilled? There was always the next gig. Not knocking the music, brothers and sisters. Love it. And then I became a Christian, and then I got ushered into legalism and judgmentalism. Doesn't fulfill. You know, and God's had me on a journey. My father, we've talked about this many times, my father. My father tried to make himself a little cistern called his golf game. Anybody ever try and be, find happiness playing golf? <laughs> I remember my dad retired. He's like, I'm like, Dad, what do you want to do? All I want to do is play some golf. He's like, I got, I got my, my, my handicap. He had his handicap number. And that was what he was doing. And I'm like, How, how's that, uh, this golf handicap thing going? He's like, it's exceedingly frustrating. Even when he hit his number, you know how it goes. You hit your, your number, but then there's always a lower number to get to. See, we have a tendency to try and find happiness in things that might give us a drop of water but won't really fulfill us. And I actually want to unpack for you how to find true happiness. Now, there's a key that you need to learn, and I think this is important, is that Jesus describes happiness as being blessed. Every time you find the word blessed in the Bible... You can translate that as happiness. Oh, how happy. Oh, how fortunate. And even though if you were to go into a, a, a big box bookstore and you were to look at all these different books about happiness, you know, people don't realize that the Bible is a book full of ideas about happiness. Like what I read earlier, Psalm 144, 15, and it said, blessed are the people in such a state, blessed are the people whose God is the Lord. And I, in my translation, said, happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Every time you read the word blessed in the Bible, that is a happy person, a fortunate person. Like things like, blessed is the person whose sins are forgiven. Like, happy are the people who are not carrying around all the baggage of sin and shame. And of course, Jesus spoke a lot about this idea of being blessed, didn't he? Now, I like to tell people all the time because I didn't grow up going to church or as part of a church. And, and, but I knew even before I believed in Jesus that Jesus was one of the greatest teachers who ever lived. Right? I, I would go into a philosophy class in college. They'd be talking about things that Jesus said. You read in the news, people bringing up stuff that Jesus said. Jesus is at the very least the greatest teacher who ever lived. Jesus was a, a great healer. Jesus was a great prophet. Right? So no matter where you are on your spiritual journey, everybody believes these things about Jesus. Now, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus is, he gave up his life so that we might know God. I believe that Jesus is the only person you should give your life to. Jesus himself. I believe he's the Messiah. The Savior of all who would believe. But Jesus, even if you don't believe all those things, if you think Jesus is a great teacher... Jesus' most famous teaching is a teaching called the Sermon on the Mount. And what's amazing is, is Jesus begins his most famous teaching. So the most famous 
teacher begins his most famous teaching with these nine statements of what a happy person is. Now, when I read the Beatitudes, I like to call this crazy happy. And the reason I like to call this crazy happy is not because we're supposed to be happy in like kind of like an awkwardly weird kind of a way. But God's plan for our happiness is found in crazy places. Places that we're not apt to look for. And I actually wrote a book called Crazy Happy, Nine Surprising Ways to Live the Truly Beautiful Life based off of the Beatitudes. And I love getting to talk about the Beatitudes here on the Hour of Power in Shepherd's Grove because... You know, Robert Schuler loved talking the Beatitudes. Pastor Bobby wrote a book on the Beatitudes. And there's nothing wiser for a pastor to do than to take the most famous teachings of the most famous teacher, Jesus, the Beatitudes, and unpack them. But I want to read them to you. And every time you see the word blessed, I want you in your mind to put in the word happy. And what you're going to find when we read this is nobody talks about happiness the way that Jesus does. Listen to what he says. This is Matthew chapter 5, picking up in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you, when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. I believe that the Beatitudes unlocks God's plan for our happiness. Now notice things. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Happy are the humble. You can read a thousand self-help books and nobody says you want to be happy. The entry point for happiness is humility. That, what that means is that pride is the antithesis of happiness. Every time we're proud, it will make us more and more unhappy. It's amazing, isn't it? It's like I always tell my son, Obadiah, he's 16. I say, buddy, your ego is not your amigo. <laughs> because I realize that when we're proud, pride keeps us from experiencing exactly what God wants us to because it's us at the center and life doesn't exist with us at the center. I would like to tell people, it's like if you expect the world to revolve around you, it'll be quite disconcerting to realize that it actually doesn't. See, so pride fights against our happiness. You want to hear a crazy plan for happiness? The second beatitude, crazy happy are those who mourn. Can, can you imagine if you're sitting there and Jesus is like, happy are those who mourn. Excuse me, Jesus? What you talking about, Willis? Like, well, you can't say that. Because most of us think that happiness is the absence of sadness, right? But not Jesus. See, Jesus says that God's plan for happiness includes and incorporates sadness. Why? Because sadness happens when we lose someone we love. I mean, the shortest verse in your Bible is that Jesus wept at the tomb of Lazarus. He loved Lazarus, and people were grieving. Now, Jesus knew Lazarus was going to die if you read the story in John's Gospel. And he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. But Jesus still wept. So I'm here to tell you that part of loving well will involve heartbreak. And so to think that Happiness only happens when I'm not sad. Completely undercuts God's plan for our lives and our happiness. But when you realize part of biblical happiness is sadness, it changes the way we look at everything, doesn't it? Because there are things that go on in the world that will break our hearts because it first breaks the heart of God. 
and that these things don't break our hearts, we would say, what's wrong with me? When we see the injustices, when we see the issues in the world, it breaks our heart. It causes grief. But I don't want you to divorce your sadness from God's plan for happiness because Jesus does it. And, I, and in the book, Crazy Happy, I unpack all of these different beatitudes and explore, like, what does it mean if this is really where happiness comes? I want to just tip my hat to it for a second. The last two beatitudes, crazy happy, are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Wow. Then Jesus personalized, happy are you when they revile you, when they persecute you, when they say all sorts of things against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad. I love when the Bible says crazy things like that. When everyone's talking nasty about you, throwing shade at you, all that stuff, guess what? Be happy. Most of us, we find our happiness in the approval of people. But Jesus in the Beatitude says, actually, if you get everything right, people will still be upset with you. And Jesus is the ultimate example of that. He always did those things that pleased his father, but he ended up crucified on a Roman cross. So what I want to tell you is if you get crazy happy in God's way, it doesn't mean everyone's going to like you. There will always be people who have a different agenda, want different things than you want to be involved in, and Jesus already tells, hey, that's okay. You don't have to worry about that. Because when it happens, God wants to do something. So I want to bring you just to one more step in this journey. Yes, God wants you to be happy. But don't forget, happiness is not going to be found in the places you think it's going to be found. Because we're going to make cisterns. God wants us to plug into the fountain of living water. The Bible tells us, Jesus is, uses the word being blessed, the Beatitudes for happiness. Here's what I want to tell you. The blessed person bears fruit. When a person does not turn from God, but embraces the Lord, then that person, that happy person begins to bear fruit in their lives. It says this in John chapter 15, verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, and so you will be my disciples. I love that. God is glorified when you and I bear much fruit. And when we find our happiness in who the Lord is, then God begins to bear fruit in our lives. And not just like one token fruit. It's kind of like if you go up to the Napa Valley and you see those beautiful hills with all the grapes on it. If you go into your favorite store and you go into the organic produce section and all those colors are there, there's all that fruit, that's what God wants your life to be and my life to be. And as we find our happiness in the Lord, he begins to bear fruit in our lives. Now you might be like, well, what kind of fruit? I'm so happy you asked. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Classic, right? What is the fruit of the Spirit? The fruit of the Spirit is love, and it's joy, and it's peace, and it's long-suffering, and kindness, and goodness, and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Now check this out. I want to give you an example. How many of you love to sit in traffic? <laughs> Anybody? No. See, I was born and raised in New Jersey. So like, I know all about traffic. I don't know anybody who likes to live in traffic. But how many of you get real worked up in traffic? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because then you have to be honest in church. And when we raise your hand, you're supposed to be like, he totally gets worked up. <laughs> right? But when you sit in traffic, we would have a tendency to think, I'll be happy when I'm out of this traffic. Right? But what if when you're in traffic, instead of doing what I like to do, which is try and see if I can change all the lanes to get there a little bit faster, am I the only one who does that? I have it on significant amounts of research that that doesn't get you there faster. I've tried, right? Like, where you're, like, changing lanes every time someone opens, oh, get over this lane. 
You never, never go faster. You're still, still in traffic, right? But it, instead of doing that, what if what we did is we say, God, I'm going to get there when I'm going to get there, and I'm going to be patient. And you use that traffic not as something that agitates you or aggravates you or steals your joy, but you say, this is an opportunity for me to be patient. And in our list of the fruit of the Spirit, there's this word called long-suffering, which is the perfect definition of patience. You have to suffer for a long time. See, what I'm, what I'm trying to get at is this. If we're always looking for happiness in the next thing, in, in the next experience, in the next happening, then you're constantly saying, I will be happy when my circumstances change. But what I want to tell you is God's plan for your happiness is not necessarily to change your circumstances, it's to change you in your circumstances. Because when you realize that every moment of our lives, every situation, whether it's happy or sad, good or bad, what you wanted or what you didn't want, when you embrace the Lord, trust Him, and allow Him to do what He wants to do, every moment is an invitation from Him to find your happiness in Jesus and bear fruit. When someone says something you don't like, oh, the fruit of the Spirit's kindness. The fruit of the Spirit's peace. The fruit of the Spirit is love. So we don't return evil for evil, we return good for evil. See, now all of a sudden what you realize is God wants you to be happy and I believe God is leveraging and grabbing hold of all the circumstances of our lives and he's saying, will you let me bear the fruit of my spirit in your heart and life right where you are and when you do it, the Father will be glorified. One last thought. Have you ever seen a fruit tree eating its own fruit? <laughs> no, right? I mean, it would be awkward to see a tree eating anything, you know, but it's like a, a, an apple tree doesn't eat an apple. The fruit is born for other people. And what God wants to do, if we were to trust Jesus and join him on this crazy happy journey, he wants to bear all this unique fruit in our life that you won't see anywhere else except in Jesus and the overflow of his life in our lives. And when that happens, the people, not only will the Father be glorified, but the people around us are now blessed by the visible presence of God in our strange, perplexing, challenging lives because he's bearing this fruit of the Spirit. And that is how the people of God get to be salt and light. So I want to just pray for us that God would bear the fruit of his spirit in our lives as we join him on this crazy happy journey. So let's bow our heads in our hearts. Father, I want to thank you so much that you want us to be happy, that you are working in our lives. And Lord, forgive us for the cisterns that we build. It's, a mis it's mistakes we make over and over again. But God, we want to experience the blessedness of what it means to be in Christ and to walk with you. And Lord, you know the details of all of our lives. You know the challenges. And I ask that you would bear the fruit that you want to bear in each one of us in the circumstances that we find ourselves in, that you might be glorified and that people might be blessed by the Christ-likeness that you are working in our lives and we ask it all in Jesus' name. And we all agreed and said together, amen, amen. and amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. Daniel, thank you so much for your word of encouragement to us today. I hope it was encouraging to you. I know it was for me. And I really, you know, Hannah and I really appreciate being able to have a couple of weeks to take a break, to spend with our family during the summer. So thank you, Daniel, for making that possible for us and thank you for joining us today would you rise for the benediction and now the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you the lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit amen 
Hannah and I are so happy that you've joined us in worship today, and we hope that you found incredible hope and inspiration from this program. Several years ago, I began practicing the Creed of the Beloved by saying it aloud each day, and now it's become a vital part of the walk that I have with the Lord. Though simple, these words have changed me from the inside out and given me renewed vision, joy, and energy. Every week on Our Power, we recite the Creed, which says, I'm not what I do, I'm not what I have, I'm not what people say about me, I am the beloved of God. It's who I am. No one can take it away from me. I don't have to worry, I don't have to hurry, I can trust my friend Jesus and share his love with the world. And that's the truth, dear friend. By resting in the Lord's boundless and unconditional love, you will experience the fullness of his blessings. When you embrace your position as his beloved child, you will be empowered to step into your true identity, to be courageous, to take risks, and to follow his call on your life. Though it's not magic, practicing this creed changed the dial on my life one degree at a time. While I didn't notice like a huge difference at first, as I regularly trained and aligned my mind with the Word of God, I developed a deep sense of rootedness and contentment. And I believe this can happen to you too. As a daily reminder of who you are in Christ, we want to send you this Creed of the Beloved bookmark. As you meditate on the truths it contains, we believe it has the potential to transform your life from the inside out. Write to Hour of Power New Zealand, PO Box 26209 Epsom, Auckland, 1344. Or phone us now on 0800 144 673. You can also contact us through our website, hourofpower.org.nz. You can tap into the energy, power, and joy that comes from living in the kingdom of God when you walk every day in your identity as His beloved. As always, we're extremely grateful for your friendship and we're continually praying for you. God loves you and so do we.